Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to the launch of the Global Terrorism Index, what I believe is the sixth edition of the Global Terrorism Index. Um, the report provides a comprehensive summary of the key global trends and patterns in terrorism over the last 20 years, covering the period from the beginning of 1998 to the end of 2017. The Global Terrorism Index is produced by an organization called the Institute for Economics and Peace, and it, uh, the index is based on data from the Global Terrorism uh, Database. Um, the Institute for Economics and Peace is the world's leading think tank dedicated to analyzing um, peace and quantifying its economic value. Today we have two speakers, um, Serge Strobantz of the Institute for Economics and Peace will introduce the index and present the findings about the key global trends in terrorism. But before that, Professor Andrew Silk uh, will deliver a keynote address to contextualize the index and uh, frame the discussion. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, just a few practical housekeeping points. First of all, please switch your phones to silent. But if you want to tweet using the handle at IIEA, please feel free to do so. Um, the addresses by both speakers will be on the record. But the question and answer session afterwards uh, will be subject to Chatham House rules, which means you can use any information you, you get during the session, but you cannot attribute it to anybody or identify any of the participants in the discussion. Um, our first speaker is Professor Andrew Silk, who is from Athlone, I think, mm -hmm. originally. Uh, he's Professor of Terrorism, Risk and Resilience at Cranfield Forensic Institute, uh, Cran Cranfield University in the UK. He has a background in forensic psychology and criminology. Um, he has been involved in working with um, practitioners in the field of counterterrorism and organized crime at various government departments, law enforcement agencies, and security agencies, mostly in the UK, but some other involvements uh, in Europe as well. He's internationally recognized as a leading expert on terrorism and uh, uh, co conflict, especially low intensity conflict. He's the author of a wide range of publications. Uh, we're very glad he can be with us today. Uh, so please welcome Professor Andrew Silk. Thank you, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, my comment, I'll keep my comments fairly, fairly brief and succinct. Um, Serge will be talking about the specifics of the report and some of the trends that are connected to that. And, and my comments are probably a bit more general in a lot of, re lot of respects and, and, and just setting the scene a little bit. Um, I'm very keen that we have reports like the one Serge is going to talk about because it highlights trends. And there's often an assumption when we're looking at terrorism and counterterrorism that what happened yesterday is going to continue to happen today and will happen again tomorrow. And that there's an assumption, for example, that Islamist terrorism is going to remain the major threat facing, um, facing Western Europe. When any examination of history tells us that isn't the case, that the type of terrorism we face and the ideologies which drive it and the motivations of the different actors changes over time. And probably one of the most famous theories on terrorism is known as the four-wave theory, and some of you might have heard of it. And this theory was developed by a guy called David Rappaport, who's based at UCLA, and, and is the, the nearest thing I've seen to a, uh, to a, a living Santa Claus. And that's exactly what he looks like. Um, and David came up with this theory um, that if you looked at history from the 1860s onwards, you could see four waves of terrorism, which were driven by different ideologies. So you had an initial wave kicking off in Russia in the 1860s that was driven by anarchist revolutionaries. 
motivated by what we would refer to as socialism or communism, but essentially they wanted to overthrow an aut autocratic uh, czarist regime. And this led to the anarchist wave of, of terrorism, which spread beyond Russia into Europe and into America, where you had revolutionaries attempting by propaganda by the deed to overthrow governments in a range of different countries. Now, what was interesting about them is that they had a shared ideology, but it's what, in modern terms, we would have called a, a distributed network, i.e. organizationally very, very loose links, shared ideology, but what was happening in one country didn't have much awareness of it in the next one, and vice versa. That wave was superseded by what David Rappaport referred to as the anti-colonial wave, and that kicks off pretty much with World War I and lasts up until largely the 1950s and 1960s. Now, you know, activities around here in 1916 and then later, 1919 to 1921, was very much part of this anti-colonial wave. And Rappaport made the point, this was essentially a reaction to the old European colonial empires, which had seized control of large parts of the world. And gradually, as the 20th century progressed, lost control, mainly because they were impoverished as a result of fighting the living daylights out of each other in Europe in the First World War and then the Second World War, but they lost these empires. This second wave was superseded in turn by what Rappaport referred to as the new left wave. And essentially what he meant here was that this was the Cold War wave, where superpowers were sponsoring terrorism in different countries and were essentially fighting each other through proxy terrorist <coughs> conflicts and insurgencies. And then finally, towards the end of the 1970s into the 1980s, Rappaport identified the religious wave, which was religiously motivated extremism. Today we look at it and we see it primarily associated with Islam, but back in the early days there were all types of religious groups, including Christian, Buddhist, and other fundamentalists, all of whom were embracing, um, embracing uh, terrorism to further their cause. Now, one of the things that, that this, this tells us is that terrorism changes over time. On average, Rappaport's waves tended to last between 40 to 50 years before they were superseded by something else. The anarchists had their heyday early on, but you continue to find anarchist groups around today. Anti-colonial groups had their heyday, but you still found remnants in different parts of the world today, and the same with communist groups and Marxist groups. So what I'm, what, I suppose the point we're making is, number one, the Islamists won't be the number one threat forever. Eventually, they're going to be superseded by something else, and we need to have a think about that as we look at, as we look at trends. What will supersede them? The other one is, in terms of thinking about the causes of terrorism, I think this is incredibly important and something that often gets overlooked. Now, Serge in the report is going to highlight that there are a number of factors that are associated with terrorist conflicts. Um, currently, the four best predictors we have that terrorism is going to emerge in a region are these. Population size. The bigger the population, the more likely it is you're going to have a terrorist conflict emerge in that region. And the bigger the population growth, the bigger the increase you're going to, or the bigger the increased risk you're going to face. Now, that's worth thinking about in terms of the next 50 to 100 years. What parts of the planet are going to experience the biggest population increase? It's not going to be Europe. Okay, Europe is more or less stable. The only country that was growing in Europe was the UK. But given half a chance with Brexit, they'll bring that under control and they'll be stable just like everybody else. So Europe is stable. Most of the West is stable. The big increase is going to take place in Africa and Asia. So we're going to see big population increases there. Um, we're particularly concerned about, uh, about what's called, or what's known as youth bulges. So this is a youth bulge in your population demographics. A big increase in the population aged in the teens to 20s. Societies which experience a youth bulge in the population tend to be very unstable. There's an increase in crime, there's an increase in instability, there's an increase in violence. So countries currently which have big youth bulges include places like Syria and Yemen, which are an absolute chronic mess. If you look at where youth bulges are about to hit, it's pretty much all across Central Africa. All right, so there's absolutely, just on that alone, some big problems on the horizon. Where, what else do we see? Other factors which are known to associate are 
human rights abuses. The higher a country or region scores on, on measures of human rights abuses, the, 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 the greater the risk of terrorism. A lack of political representation. The less political representation a society has, the greater the risk of terrorism. And then one of the other remaining factors that, that correlates well with risk of terrorism is contagion. If the region next door to you is experiencing a bad terrorist conflict, that increases the likelihood that you're going to experience a bad terrorist conflict as well. Doesn't necessarily mean that the guys who are ca causing trouble next door cross the border and also start destabilizing you, but possibly they act as an inspiration or a model for dissidents within your own society to, to follow. Now, <clears throat> those are the factors which, which we have which, which are reasonably good at predicting terrorism. A couple of factors which aren't in there, crucially, well, number one, ideology. Ideology does not predict terrorism. Radicalization, as we understand it, does not predict the emergence of, of terrorism. Um, and these are, these are, these are, this is troublesome, because most European countries, certainly, their counterterrorism strategies are built on the assumption that ideology, an extremist ideology, is the primary or the major driver of radicalization and thus the major cause of terrorism. The scientific, scientific evidence to back that up is weak. But nonetheless, it keeps getting flagged as being the, the, one of the primary root causes of terrorism. Looking down the future, just briefly, over the next 50 years, what are the trends we should think about in terms of thinking about the fifth wave? What replaces the Islamists? What becomes the new big problem? Well, number one, we look at population. Where is population going to increase? Because the conflicts are going to come out of those zones. And we already know it's Africa, Southeast Asia, Asia. Those are going to experience the big population increases. There's also going to continue to be a fairly substantial population increase in the Middle East, so we can expect that to remain volatile. Another factor which is going to be increasingly important is climate change. The US military has quite correctly identified climate change as a strategic threat to the US. Now, the US president <laughs> is working on it. <coughs> but the military are absolutely correct. Climate change is going to have an impact in terrorism and low intensity conflict. It already has. Some of you will be familiar, for example, with the fact when we look at the Syrian conflict, the Syrian conflict is often pitched in terms of spillover from Iraq. Um, Islamic State being an offshoot of Al-Qaeda, Islamist ideology kicking in and all the rest of that. And that, you know, there may be a role for some of it, but that overlooks, for example, that in the five years between 2005 and 2010, Syria experienced the worst drought in its recorded history, which completely destroyed agriculture in eastern Syria, leading to a collapse of the local economies and a, a, a mass migration from eastern Syria into the cities and towns. At the same time that you get this collapse, you also have a massive influx of refugees coming in from Iraq. Now this put extraordinary pressure onto an infrastructure which was already not in particularly fantastic shape, and it collapsed. And what you have in the aftermath of this is essentially a civil war emerging where ultimately Islamic State are ex able to exploit the situation. But for most people, Environmental collapse and climate change doesn't feature into a discussion of what happened in Syria. Another even brilliant example, and I'll, I'll finish on this point, is the rise of Boko Haram in northern Nigeria. Now, if you look at a map of northern Nigeria, most maps of northern Nigeria are dominated by Lake Chad. So Lake Chad sits in the corner, a massive lake that roughly the size of Scotland. Now, that's what it looks like on most maps. But in reality, Lake Chad doesn't exist. It is gone by and large. It has completely dried up due to a range of different factors. Now, imagine a lake the size of Scotland disappears. What impact is that going to have on the populations living on the, uh, on the edges of that lake? You had massive environmental collapse taking place in that region, which preceded the rise of Boko Haram and yet, in most analysis, people aren't looking at that. Instead, they're talking about the influence of Al-Qaeda, the influence of Salafist ideology, and ignoring the lived reality on the ground for the people and the communities that are living in that area.
Looking ahead to this century, I'm a pessimist when it comes to efforts to prevent climate change. I don't think we're going to be able to keep it below three degrees. I think it's going to be higher. I think the impact that that is going to have is going to be catastrophic in a lot of areas. I think regions where you combine big population increase, major climate change effects, this is going to become, for me, one of the big drivers of terrorism and insurgency as we, as we look forward for the next 50 to 100 years. To talk about current trends and where we are now, I'll pass over to Serge. Food for thought there, and I'm sure for questions uh, later on. But first, we will have Serge Strobantz uh, introducing the uh, Global Terrorism Index in, in some detail. Serge is Director of Operations for Europe and the MENA region at the Institute for, Institute for Economics and Peace. He's a former colonel in the Belgian Armed Forces. He has an academic specialization in uh, political sciences, international relations, security and defense, global risk analysis, crisis management. He's assistant professor at the Vesalius College in Brussels. Uh, he's a senior academic specialist in global terrorism and radicalization in Belgium and Europe. And he will now present us the findings of the GTI. Thank you very much. Do I really need to get up there? <laughs> All right, let's do this. Uh, so thank you very much for, oh, for a very good uh, introduction. I mean, I'm doing this type of presentation throughout Europe, and I have to say that this was, uh, if not the best, one of the best presentations. But uh, Andrew, I, I really thought you were going to crack the joke about uh, Donald Trump have been recognized also by the US Army as a strategic threat to the United States uh, as he is uh, going on now. Um, thank you very much for having me here today and having the Institute uh, presenting in, uh, in, in Dublin. It, it all started with a, a text message to my good friend uh, Brendan O'Shea sitting in the back, then connected with uh, Claude in the, in, in the front. And um, this is us having this uh, presentation today. So thank you for supporting uh, my good idea and uh, making, making this, uh, this happen. We are really, really pleased to be, uh, to be here today. Um, presenting in Dublin for me something, uh, or presenting in Ireland for me something really, uh, really, uh, really special. I am uh, myself a former uh, rugby international for Belgium, which means absolutely nothing. <laughs> 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 but still, I also heard my anthem uh, wearing my uh, national sh shirt. So uh, Brendan and Garrett know very much that I'm really interested in the, in, uh, the second best team in the world, being uh, Ireland. And this is why, in a very rebellious way today, I'm wearing also my All Blacks uh, uh, <laughs> socks. Uh, so jokes apart, let's start, let's start. So I just, could I just click on this? Yeah, there we go. All right, so this is the Institute for Economics and Peace, so we are focusing on uh, quantifying and me measuring peace and also identifying the economic drivers and benefits that are uh, correlated, correlating with, uh, with peace. We have six offices, so the headquarters are in Sydney, Australia. I'm adding the office in Brussels. There is another European office in The Hague. We have an office in Harare, Zimbabwe. And we have an office in New York that is connected to the office in uh, Mexico City, as we produce on an annual basis also a Mexican Peace Index. The main publication of the Institute is the Global Peace Index that is produced every year in June and published every year in, uh, in June. Uh, next to this uh, data-driven research, we also invest a lot in uh, communication and in the propagation of the, of the results of our research. So reach about 5 billion people uh, through uh, regular media, and we have more than 800 million uh, internet or social media hits. Uh, and as has been said before, so we do this. We also produce uh, research for a lot of international organizations, and uh, we have the chance to be ranked in the top 15 most influential think tanks uh, in the world. The Global Terrorism Index, this is the sixth uh, edition uh, this year. Uh, we rank 163 countries, uh, same amount of countries that are just ratified the Global Compact on Migration this morning. Uh, but this is uh, representing more than 99% of the world population. The remaining countries are those that are too small, uh, either in geography, or in, uh, in, uh, yeah, in geography or in population to be able to be uh, part of a statistic uh, analysis. Uh, we measure the relative impact of terrorism, and I will give more explanation on this, uh, on this later. 
Uh, terrorism is one of the 23 indicators that we use to, uh, to compile the Global uh, Peace Index. We do it at the Institute for Economics and Peace, and it, this is guided by uh, a panel of international uh, recognized experts. This is the methodology. So we always start with the definition, which is the uh, illegal use of uh, violence or the fear of violence uh, against, uh, so by a non-state actor to attain a political, economic, religious, social uh, uh, goal. So it's violence, the fear of violence and intimidation. So we start with the global terrorist database that is compiled by the START Consortium, the University of Maryland in the United States. This uh, data set uh, goes through the filter of uh, four indicators, in the num number of incidents, number of injuries, the number of people uh, who get killed in the attacks, and also property damage. And we give a certain weight going from one to three, three being the highest uh, weight, and this is given to the uh, amount of uh, uh, deadly casualties. Uh, so over the four uh, different uh, indicators. We also recognize terrorism as a specific type of violence, so it's just more than just the act of violence, it's also the, the persistent uh, sentiment of vulnerability and fear of the violence. So this is why over a period of five years, we all, every year we divide by two the, the impact of, of an attack or the figures of the years before, just to represent the persistence of, uh, of this uh, sentiment of fear and vulnerability. We also uh, so use our statistic uh, techniques, I would say, so logarithmic bending to make sure that we are able to represent the relative impact. So it's when your, the, your level of terrorism is zero and you go from zero to 10, there is a huge difference uh, compared to another country where they are at 1,000, they go from 1,000, 1,000 to 10. So this logarithmic bending allows us to, uh, to really uh, represent or present the uh, relative impact of terrorism. This is how we are able to compile the Global Terrorism Index, and then we uh, cross-check that with our databases on socio-economic uh, socio databases to really make sure that in the trends in the evolution, in the shifting balances, we really identify the trends and uh, the drivers of, uh, of terrorism. So there we go with the result. Uh, results always good and, uh, and bad news. So the good news is that uh, last year uh, we saw a reduction of the relative impact of terrorism by 27% on, on a global scale. Since the peak of terrorism, so since the peak of the fourth wave, uh, Andrew, so we, we have uh, a decline by 44% since, uh, so in the last uh, three years. We have seen that 94 countries improved their score, so had a better score on the Global Terrorism Index, while 46 were deteriorating. And we saw in uh, the total amount of death in Europe fell, uh, falling by 75%. So this is really an important, uh, an important decrease in U Europe in the past year. The bad news uh, related to that is that the amount of uh, incidents increased in 2017. So we have, we have had more terrorist attacks in 2017, but a drop in 75% drop in the amount of casualties resulting from those, from those attacks. So this is a direct result from, uh, I would say, the impact that the international community has had on, uh, on Daesh in Syria and Iraq, where this capability to, uh, to prepare, to plan, and to conduct command and control large-scale attacks, or really uh, new type of attacks, uh, disappeared over the, past, over the past years. And now we are facing another type of threat, which is more homegrown, that is not so organized, and that is not so effective. So we have more attacks but less effective uh, attacks over the, past, over the past year. What we also see, and although it's still a very small, uh, it's a very small phenomenon, phenomenon compared to the figures of global terrorism, and I will show you uh, a table later on with, with, the, with the figures, we see a rise in far-right extremist, national extremist uh, uh, terrorism. As I said, the figures are not comparable to what we see on, on a global scale, but over the past four to five years, we have seen a permanent increase of uh, this type of uh, of terrorism. And terrorism is still a global phenomenon with 67 countries suffering more than uh, one casualty. Let's continue. Uh, so we have the usual suspects, the five countries recording more than 1,000 deaths, and we are exactly there where, where you left us. Uh, so Nigeria, Syria and Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan. And we see Somalia always also coming close to this uh, top five. So five countries with more than 1,000 deaths. 19 countries with more than 100 deaths. 
Somalia and Egypt, uh, recording the, uh, the biggest deteriorations in their scores. Uh, in both cases, this is linked to one single attack. So for, uh, for Somalia, this was a car bomb next to a fuel truck on a market in Mogadishu, killing more than 580 people. For Egypt, attack on a mosque by Al-Qaeda in the uh, Sinai Pen uh, Peninsula, killing more than 330 uh, 30 people. The third line is a line that I have to explain every year for the past six years now. In 99% of the terrorism death uh, occurred in countries that are either engaged in violent conflict or who exercise or practice political terror or high levels of political terror on their population. So we, when we are talking about uh, terrorism in the West, we are looking at the last percent. I think this is almost uh, clear to, uh, to all of us. Uh, and what we also see is a shift uh, to uh, uh, East Asia and Southeast Asia. So terrorism is now developing more and more in, in Asia and East and Southeast Asia. Uh, we have seen that ISIL or Daesh, as we, we want to call them, uh, the, the, the number of uh, casualties that they, that they uh, produce was done by 52% last year, but still Daesh is the most deadly group uh, in the world. And Iraq and Syria are the biggest improvers. Uh, minus 5,500 deaths in Iraq and minus 1,000 deaths compared to 2016 in, uh, in uh, Syria. So this is showing you, uh, I'm showing you, basically showing the fourth wave. But when you look at the fourth wave, you will also see that we have like mini waves within the fourth waves. And so when we look at this part of the slide, so this after the exponential increase until 2014 and then the decrease since 2016, either we can conclude that we are very good at we became very good at counterterrorism in 2014, or that this decrease is just the start of a new peak that might emerge in the coming years. So it, depending on how you look at it, if you look at the different waves or if you just look at the success over the last two, three years. This success is a combination of external and internal action. So, of course, crushing Daesh, crushing the, the threat where it emerges, but also reinforcing, especially in Europe, reinforcing uh, the capacity and the efficiency of uh, intelligence and security services in Europe also. We have seen over the past two, three years that more uh, attacks have been foiled than ever before. So this is also a double message. Either we could say a very positive message telling the, the population that we are now very good at counter-terrorism and that we foil and that we stop most of the terrorist uh, actions. But it's, this is also confirming the high level of threat that is posing by, by terrorism, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, that terrorism is uh, posing to our societies. We can also see when we see this evolution and different mini waves that uh, the start of a new wave is always an, uh, an act of foreign policy. and, and, and I won't say I won't, I won't link it to an, an intervention or an invasion somewhere in the world, but we, we can see that when there is an influx on, on, this, uh, on, the, on this graph, there is always a political decision and most of the time an act of foreign policy that is either uh, provoke, provoking an increase or a decrease in the relative impact of uh, terrorism. So those are the deaths from terrorism by country. We see that Afghanistan is now the number one, accounting for 25% of uh, the casualties. This is disturbing because uh, Iraq has been the number one in this list for almost all, for all six uh, editions of the, the terrorism index. And when we open this time window in the last 10 to 15 years, in more than 80, 80 to 90% of, of, uh, of the cases, Iraq was number one in this list. So we see a clear shift from the Middle East to Asia, East Asia, and we also see uh, a clear deterioration of security situation in Afghanistan after the, the NATO intervention and in the new type of mission that is more in support of the local security forces. What we also see, even if terrorist is uh, really increasing in Afghanistan, we also see an increase in the attacks against uh, milit military forces, security forces, and police forces in the same country. So the conclusion you can draw from this is that the Taliban, but also Daesh, active in this country, see now a new window of opportunity to be more assertive and to be, have more effect in, in Afghanistan than it was uh, capable to do and possible to do uh, in the years uh, before. The largest decreases in death, so Iraq, uh, 
2016, the Battle of Mosul, Iraq was still the largest uh, increase. Uh, it is now stabilized and we see a direct effect. Syria is, uh, is following and then you can go on and on and on. Nigeria is only number four, uh, uh, number five, sorry, on the, uh, no, no, number four on this side, uh, minus 300. But you need to know that Nigeria was the largest decrease last year with a drop by 80% in the amount of uh, casualties in 2016. The largest increase in death, uh, Somalia and Egypt, I already spoke about this. And we look at the countries down there, we are exactly in those regions where that you were talking about uh, before. The four deadliest terrorist groups, so I said uh, Daesh is still the most uh, deadly group, but a, a drop by 52%. We see comparable movements here for uh, the Taliban. Uh, we still see a decrease for uh, uh, Boko Haram also. But what is disturbing is this uh, permanently evolving and increasing impact of a group called uh, Al-Shabaab in Eastern uh, Africa. This is the economic impact of terrorism. So, of course, this is following also the, uh, the, the graph of the relative impact of terrorism as such. It is estimated at 52, 52 billion in 2017. So we still see a decrease compared to 2016. This is just an evaluation, a very conservative evaluation of the impact of terrorism linked to the four indicators that we use to create the index. So we spoke during the, the lunch before about uh, an, an evaluation in the UK of the economic impact of those, this, these permanent recurring attacks uh, uh, in, in, in London, for example. Those figures do not account for the investments uh, made in, in counterterrorism because one, it's very difficult to define counterterrorism because it really reaches from over the four pillars that you have uh, spoken about. And a lot of countries do not uh, provide the data about their, their uh, investment. So this is just the four pillars. So now if you look at uh, the trends, this is still, uh, we still see that bombings ex and explosives and also armed assault are the most uh, likely to be used tactics by terrorist groups uh, uh, globally. Uh, so now, this is a very interesting slide, among many others, of course. But this is a very interesting one. When you take the, the top three regions impacted by terrorism, so the MENA region, South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, these three regions over a period of 15 years account for 92% of all terrorist attacks. When you look at the position of Europe, we come uh, sixth, so top three, Asia Pacific, Russia, Eurasia, and there comes Europe. Look at those figures, and please do not get me wrong, every death accounted on this slide is one too many. It's one too much. That's for sure. So, but when you look at those figures, and especially in comparison to the top three, when you go down two places, when you go to top eight, over 15 years, then you can ask yourself if this is really the first threat to our security. All right? When you look at those figures over 15 years, I personally am asking myself the question, is this really the first threat to our security? There is a difference, and I think this is an unacceptable difference, between those figures and those figures, is that those figures are very mediatized, so a lot of media attention for those figures. And the other uh, evolution there is that both, both Europe and Northern America are living in, very, uh, in a very secure environment. So we have been living at peace for more than 70 years now. We all have this perception to live in a very secure environment. So when you get targeted in the, this last little bit of a percent of insecurity that, that, that is impossible to, to, really, um, to, really, to really take away from our societies, the perception of vulnerability, this perception of fear is even stronger than other regions where I would say uh, terrorism is becoming, has, bec has become a, a daily routine. When well, the day of the attacks in Brussels in 2016, I received two uh, text messages, one from a friend in Kabul and one from a friend in, uh, in Baghdad, asking me if I was okay. And I answered, yes, I am, thank you very much, but do not expect that I'm going to send you three text messages a day to ask you if you are okay in the coming weeks. So there is a difference in perception also between those regions where terrorism is really a threat to security and where those regions where terrorism is perceived as a threat to, uh, to security. 
So this uh, so those the average scores. So you see an evolution there also <laughs> between uh, the different uh, region. This is just confirming what uh, we have done uh, before. The type of attacks again. So you see different type of attacks that is confirming uh, the I would say the likelihood of the, the use of uh, bombs, explosives, and armed uh, assault. But this is then distributed per uh, per region. Uh, we also see this evolution. This is a very interesting slide. Uh, because you see that the two graphs, one, uh, one graph is depicting the evolution of the amount of death caused by armed conflict, and the other one is the same type of evolution, uh, but for uh, death caused by terrorism. And you see that there is, it's all, those are almost the same, uh, the same graph, or at least parallel graphs, so clearly linking uh, the, the two concepts, so armed conflict and, uh, and, and terrorism. There again, by, by conflict, there again we try to see, so this is uh, a co collaboration with uh, UCDP, so the University of Uppsala in, uh, in Sweden. They define war as uh, a conflict to at least a situation in which uh, there are more than 1,000 deaths per year. Minor armed conflict, 25 to 1,000. Uh, no, no conflict uh, below 25 uh, deaths per year. And we clearly see uh, that in case of, uh, of war, in case of armed conflict, this is where uh, death occur in, uh, in the first place. Also, the evolution of death from terrorism in Western Europe and Northern America. So Western Europe is uh, the blue part of the, of the slide, just to give you an idea of the evolution in the last years. And there again, confirming the previous slides, we see of course, a larger, in, a larger impact because of the, the, the neighborhood and the vicinity in Western Europe than it was than it had in uh, Northern America, but still an increasing, uh, increasing level in Northern America. ISIL activity in Western Europe and North America. So the the plain blue, the plain blue part of those histograms is showing you. Uh, terrorist activities from other groups or even other ideologies than the Islamist ideology, other groups than, than Daesh. And then you see a different distribution per country, where in France, for example, almost all, all death, all, all the activities are related to Daesh. And then you, if you shift to other countries, uh, you see that this is not, uh, not the case anymore. Uh, Spain, for example, but also the UK, you will see that Daesh is not uh, the first sponsor of uh, terrorism in those, in those countries. So a very different distribution over the, the different countries. This is showing you the evolution of far-right extremism and, and terrorism death over the past uh, 10 years. And you clearly see that in the past five years, this is where, after 2011-12, this is where the figures start to increase to the level that we have today. That is almost five to six times higher that, than we have four, uh, four to five years ago. So I said, when you look at those figures, not comparable at all to the, to the global, global figures, but this small phenomenon is, uh, is on the rise. So are we looking at the shifting uh, landscape? So this is the evolution of death in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, in the Global Terrorism Index, the IAP has recognized three new hotspots, or three hotspots where we should keep an eye on uh, for the future. So Maghreb and, uh, and the Sahel, so really in the northern part of Africa, uh, Nigeria as such, but another type of terrorism that could emerge over there. And then, of course, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, this is the evolution of terrorism in, uh, in Myanmar and the Philippines. So you clearly see over the last eight years the increase of the impact of terrorism in Myanmar and especially also in the Philippines on Mindanao first. Two reasons for this, of course, Daesh that is migrating to the south southeast and also uh, the communist guerrilla, communist rebellion, uh, still active in, in, in the country. You need to, uh, when you look at the actions of the International Coalition Against Daesh, starting 2014-15 and of course uh, 16 uh, in the Middle East, crushing, crushing Daesh, it's very positive when you look at the figures uh, in, in Europe, for example, but it has uh, a less positive consequences for, uh, for the rest of the world. You need to try to imagine uh, uh, being... Uh, strategic leader of Daesh, or strategic military leader. So you look at your group of foreign terrorist fighters, which can be considered as your specialized troops or even special forces. And then you see that, you, I mean, Syria and Iraq are lost. What are you going to do with those, uh, 
with your special forces? Are you going to send them back to the country of origin, so for most of them to, uh, to the region or to Europe? Uh, or are you going to use those forces and move them to other parts of the world where we see a lot of uh, socio-economic factors of destabilization and uh, for most of the country in which, in which they are present also low levels of governance already existing conflicts on which you can just uh, plug in uh, your uh, your terrorist groups and your approach uh, approach to terrorism basically this is what happened there is there was no need there was no strategic uh, effect for the uh, the leaders of Daesh to send their troops back to uh, to Europe, because there were already troops in Europe, and they are called the homegrown, homegrown terrorist fighters. Um, for Daesh, it's okay if you, if you just keep this level of per or this perception of vulnerability and fear. The big movements, the big ideas, uh, the big attacks are not necessary anymore, and anyhow, they are not capable of of conducting them anymore. So, shifting to other regions, either south into uh, into Central Africa or east to Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, I would say only. Uh, logic, military uh, approach to, uh, to the use of, of your forces and especially to the use of your uh, specialized forces. Uh, when you look at those slides, uh, the evolution is comparable also uh, in Nigeria, where of course you will see uh, the action of the Nigerian Defense Forces really pushing out Boko Haram to the northeast. So this was the first phase. What did we see at that time is that Boko Haram just left uh, Nigeria, so left this area in which those Nigerian defense forces had, had authority and were, go, uh, and were uh, getting resources from the neighboring countries, the so-called Lake Chad Basin uh, countries. It's only when a combination of this action by the Nigerian defense forces together with this multinational joint task force in this region that we saw uh, a real decrease of the uh, impact of uh, Boko Haram. What is more disturbing for Nigeria is, of course, good news, Boko Haram is less effective, but there again we have another group that is now emerging, or has been emerging over the past, uh, past years, called the Fulani extremists, that in the middle belt of Nigeria are becoming more and more active and committing more and more uh, attacks. And uh, by the way, I don't know if you can concur with this, but I think that in Africa, most of the terrorist groups uh, are growing out of the competition between uh, nomadic troops with cattle and then uh, sedentary groups with uh, doing agriculture and it's all about the distribution of uh, water and food resources in, in Africa. So as you have said, uh, climate change and this competition for resources are creating terrorism in, uh, in Africa. Uh, terrorist recruitment. Uh, this uh, slide shows you that uh, ISIL is targeting individuals with a criminal background. So this is showing you that radicalization is done in violence, where uh, Daesh is looking for the easy job, already targeting people that are violent, people that recognized that uh, violence and the use of violence can also make them achieve uh, some of their goals. Uh, and, and therefore, they just have to radicalize them for uh, 10 or 20 percent to, to bring them to full violence, which is also showing you that at some point, the ideology as such is just a justification for the use of violence, but it's not really the driver of, uh, of terrorism. Uh, a side comment to this slide. Uh, all those criminal people, all those people with a violent background, there is a reason why those people are violent and why they have this background also. And this is then the link that you can make with the social economic factor, the social economic situation of those people uh, within our uh, society. Foreign fighters by country, so there again, we can see that the providers of the foreign terrorist fighters are the MENA region, Russia, Eurasia, and Europe com comes third. Of course, neighborhoods, a lot of migration coming from the same regions within Europe, a connection, a connection through the ideology, uh, so this is understandable. Uh, for the first pillar, for this first pillar of the Instagram, uh, I'm all, always making the remark that we can uh, try to identify those who really uh, follow the ideology and really fought for Daesh and how much of this youth bunch of the neighboring countries because the larger part of the MENA regions uh, uh, pro uh, providing foreign fighters to, uh, to Daesh, uh, the, 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 countries, the country providing most of those fighters to Tunisia. Tunisia that went with a, an, an enormous youth bunch, went through two uh, socio-economic revolutions to, to be today in a situation that is worse than before those two revolutions. So imagine the impact that that could have on this youth. Uh, 
and especially, I would say that a certain percentage of this large part of the foreign terrorist fighters are basically expats, people that could find a job, a well-paid job, in a neighboring country called the Islamic State. There again, uh, another, another slide. This is looking at the strategies to deal with returning foreign fighters in our, in our, in our societies. And I think this is really uh, telling us a lot, a lot of uh, positive information, or at least information that we could take along, is that when you look at uh, the main countries, in, and you can put Belgium there also, uh, the main countries here in, uh, in Western Europe, you will see that uh, the actions regarding returnees are basically repression. So criminalization, prosecution, imprisonment, revocation of citizenship and, and of the passport. When you look at those regions of the parts of the world that are really impacted by the phenomenon of terrorism, you will see that there will be a larger uh, investment into rehabilitation and de-radicalization programs. And that's basically it. So these were the key finding strengths of the Global Terrorism Index 2018. And now I finish by telling you that you can follow us on all our social media, our website visionofhumanity.org. If you go to the website, you can find uh, this report in full. Uh, you can access also an interactive map where you can click country per country. You can get the full stats uh, and you will find also all our other publications. Thank you very much.